uh, welcome to the first um, in a series of uh, presentations this spring um, sponsored by the IEDP, International Educational Development Program. Uh, my name is Dan Wagner. I know many of you, but not everybody. And um, I'm particularly pleased that we have as our first speaker uh, of our spring series, uh, Robert Bob Prouty from the Fast Track Initiative. Many of you have seen the posters that are up or the electronic posters that have been sent around um, that show um, sort of the second half of his uh, very distinguished career in uh, international education. Um, we had the pleasure, some of us, of, of uh, meeting over lunch beforehand and we, we got a rather more interesting, detailed set of uh, personal experiences that I won't have time for, unfortunately, but they involve uh, various wild animals in Africa. During some of his earlier experiences, um, he did, unlike uh, many people who have worked um, for quite a number of years at the World Bank, uh, Bob is not an economist, but actually got his degree in education at uh, Michigan State University. And also, unlike most of us, uh, even those of us who feel like we're in, in international education, Bob has actually spent time uh, in the field I, um, for lengthy periods of time. First, um, in Zaire for six years, I was unaware of that whole experience. Uh, working in uh, secondary education, that was before his PhD work. And then subsequently four years in Rwanda in a rural uh, university um, near the Congolese border. Um, I think it's fair to say that people who have that kind of uh, rich experience in the field, living a life that is not an easy one, but is also very enriching from a perspective of understanding how people live who are poor and living in difficult circumstances is something that can't help but color and inform your career. And it has always been, um, Bob has always been one of the people that I uh, sought out in his days as um, more or less a, um, an education specialist in the Africa section of the World Bank. And then more recently, his uh, being selected as the very top person, the director of the Fast Track Initiative, um, which is uh, maybe one of the most important jobs and responsibilities in international education today, at least in my view. Um, so while he spent, I guess, uh, uh, 20 years at the World Bank, about 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, now uh, four or five years at the Fast Track Initiative, Bob is one of those people that is widely recognized, uh, both for an ability to uh, understand education in the field, but also, and this is maybe the more remarkable story, being able to find his way through an incredible, incredibly complex world of a diplomacy with respect to donor organizations, multilateral organizations, um, teacher unions. Um, this is not an easy job. And it may seem that people in Washington or Paris who have these rather high level positions, it makes it um, easy to get decisions made. Um, quite the opposite is the case. And uh, for somebody to be able to do that, um, on top of being a person who knows the field, who knows also the regions where many of these programs take place, is really an unusual combination. So it's um, a real pleasure to be able to make these few remarks uh, in support of, uh, or in honor of Bob Prouty's visit with us today. Uh, we're delighted you're here, Bob, and the floor is yours. What we'll do is he'll take about 40 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll have time for questions and answers uh, following that. Okay, thanks, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, for being here as well. You can see the, the the title of the presentation: "Adding Learning to the Education for All Agenda." Uh, I, I will say up front that I'm I'm, I'm quite happy to to stray uh, a little bit from the presentation if if uh, questions come up or if there is interest in it. Uh, I know we've, we've structured this so that I will uh, talk, as Dan said, uh, first, 
and then we'll have an opportunity afterwards uh, for questions. But also, if something comes up over the course of the, of the presentation, um, you know, please feel free to, uh, to jump right in. I will also just give you a little bit of background. I, I'm assuming that most of you uh, have a general sense of the Education for All program and the Millennium Development Goals and what that's about. Uh, I, I will speak to that just very briefly, uh, and I'll speak a little bit uh, to the to the fast track initiative that, that I that I run. But I would like us also to get into some of the more uh, challenging questions of uh, of, uh, of voice and legitimacy. Uh, Questions around what's you know what is the appropriate role of, of external actors in an education system? Uh, this is the sort of a, uh, of a uh, of an ethical challenge I think that's often not spoken of, and yet that that each of you, uh, if you go on to pursue a career in, in the area that you're preparing for now, uh, each of you is going to come up against this, and it's certainly something that uh, that I have. Uh, had to deal with, as Dan has said, in a lot of the negotiations and back and forth that we have on a, on a, on a pretty regular basis. So as I, as I give this presentation, I, I will also bring in some of those aspects about kind of who gets to decide and, and, and what is the role of, uh, of external actors. But let me just start off by talking a little bit about this, 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 this very question of uh, external players to the system. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, if there ever were an example of uh, a set of uh, decisions being taken at quite a remove from those who are most impacted uh, by those uh, decisions, it would be the Millennium Development Goals. In uh, the year 2000, for no good reason other than it was a nice round number, and uh, people felt the urge to do something to celebrate the, 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 the change of, uh, of, of centuries and millennia. Uh, if you're mathematically inclined, you would say they anticipated the new millennium by a year. But nonetheless, uh, in the year 2000, there was, there was uh, an international consensus uh, that uh, we would try to do some things that, that we hadn't done before. Uh, I characterize this as, as the international community playing a game of, of, of what if. Uh, what if we could cut poverty in half? What if we could reduce the, the number of child deaths by two thirds? So the number of maternal, uh, the number of mother deaths, the, the maternal mortality rate uh, by uh, three fourths. Uh, pertinent for our discussion today, what if we could get every child in school? And these, these ultimately uh, took shape as the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, interesting study in and of themselves, the, the eighth one kind of being the, the commitments of the partners uh, on their side of it to support development. Uh, what if number two is the one uh, that uh, we'll talk about a bit more here. Um, what if we could get every child in school? You know, what would that mean? What would that look like? Uh, there, was a, there was actually a, another one added on there. What if we could get the same number of girls in school? It was divided between uh, 2005 and 2015. But the, the basic idea, uh, what if we could imagine uh, a better world, quite different from the one that we currently have. Uh, in 2000, uh, at that point, we were working on the basis of statistics. The latest statistics actually available at that point were 1997. And those statistic statistics were disheartening. They showed a, uh, as you will see right here, uh, they showed a, a very uh, uh, stagnant uh, trend in terms of uh, education worldwide. Uh, the 1990s, as had been the 1980s, were characterized by more children out of school at the end of the decade uh, than at the start of the decade. The, if you look uh, at the, uh, the, the bottom line there is Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at the uh, enrollment rates for Sub-Saharan Africa around 1980, uh, and then you look 20 years further to, to the time that these discussions were going on, uh, you'll find basically nothing happened. There's actually been a little bit of a dip, and then it came back up a little bit, but more or less, you had something like, uh, I think it was actually 79% of children uh, were, were uh, attending school in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in, uh, in 1980, and pretty much exactly the same percentage uh, in, in 2000. Actually, what we knew in 2000 was 1997, so it even looked a little bit more, more bleak than that. So this was, a, um, this was an odd time to be playing a game of what if. Uh, there was no real reason to believe uh, that there was going to be any change. The Jam Tien meetings in Bangkok, which had been where the whole idea of education for all had first been developed, um, hadn't really produced much of a bang, uh, at least not that was apparent at that point. 
And then there was the question of legitimacy. Why should a, a, a group of essentially international bureaucrats you know, be deciding this? Uh, now, the 2000 uh, meetings were held in uh, Dakar, Senegal, uh, but uh, already by that time, uh, you know, the agenda had been pretty much set and the decisions, you go into these big meetings more or less with decisions in place. So there's a, an initial question. Uh, what is the role? And I want you to, to think about this. I'm not going to give you immediate answers, but I want you to think about this as we, as we talk on. What is, what is the role of external players in this whole process? Well, some would argue that uh, because you have, uh, you're privileged to certain kinds of information that others are not, that you have some responsibilities around that information. And I, I will show you in, in a moment or two uh, some of those kinds of things. Uh, the, the impacts, the potential impacts of, of education, girls' education in particular. But nonetheless, uh, the critics had a field day in 2000. Uh, I can show you books, I can give you titles and authors, and I'm sure your, uh, your professor can do the same thing. Um, uh, books, uh, one uh, you know, the, it was The Long Walk Home. There, anyway, the different books uh, that were written, and, and essentially they derided the establishment of this particular goal, saying that we had gone nowhere in 20 years, there was no reason to believe anything could be done. Uh, they essentially, you could characterize these uh, arguments as saying, you know, same old United Nations, uh, pie in the sky, dreamers, empty promises. But as I say, uh, if you take a look at this uh, chart a little more closely, you'll notice that from 2000 on, uh, in fact, we've, uh, we don't yet have a full decade of data. We've, we've now passed the, a decade since then. Uh, but if you look at the data since then, something dramatic has happened. Uh, in the period since 2000, from 2000 to 2008, uh, the, uh, the uh, enrollment rates have absolutely surged. Uh, in, uh, in Africa, the, uh, th this year, a gross enrollment uh, at primary school level uh, hit 100% for the first time. That doesn't mean 100% of children are in school, but that means they're overage children and so on. That means, however, that the system actually is accommodating uh, as many children as they've got out there. If they were more efficient, that would mean everybody were, uh, could find a place in, in, in a theoretical world. At the very least, it means that there are far more children in school uh, than there had ever been. The, the United Nations doesn't get a lot of credit, I think, uh, and, and there probably wasn't, a, there wasn't, a, they weren't going into this expecting to get a lot of credit, but if, if you look at the end of the decade, you'd have to say that that game of what if actually ultimately produced something. Uh, there have been uh, changes that are, that are astonishing. In fact, I would say uh, yeah, almost uh, uh, outrageously uh, powerful idea of, of trying to get the world behind uh, these goals. The EFA goals are divided into six parts. I won't spend a lot of time on that uh, since you know that. But again, this powerful idea is that every child in this millennium will have the chance to go to school, to learn to read, and then to be able to enjoy all those good things uh, that come from that. Uh, we've seen ample evidence that, that education in some ways could be considered the anti-Pandora. You know, a lot, of, a lot of nasty things have been let out of the box over the years. Uh, if we're talking about fertility rates, infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, uh, astonishingly high numbers. Education is the anti-Pandora to put a lot of those things back in the box. And I, I say sometimes that uh, when we're talking about, uh, about education, we shouldn't be talking uh, you know, outside the box. We're talking about inside the box. Uh, you know, what's happening inside that box? And how are we getting some of these things back in? And if it's Pandora's box, there's a lot of things that can go back in that box. Um, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the issue of, of uh, kind of the, the positive things that we can achieve or, or some of the things you can, you can, you can uh, undo uh, with education, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but an article just this, uh, this year in The Lancet attributed half of the reduction in child mortality over the past 40 years to better education of women. That's a rather astonishing figure. Uh, that means if you want to get uh, improvements in health, there's this cross-sectoral thing going on. Uh, improvements in health, uh, then you need to invest in education. And, and the second bullet there, if you're thinking in terms of cost-effectiveness of interventions, this is quite astonishing. For every one-year increase in the average education of reproductive age women, a year of education costs us anywhere, it, it varies, uh, it costs anywhere from roughly $50 to $150 in low-income countries. These are not high costs. For every one-year increase in the average education of reproductive age women, a country experiences a, almost a 10% decrease in child deaths. Uh, worldwide, 8.2 million fewer children in 2009 uh, than there had been 
about uh, you know, 50 years earlier, or 40 years earlier in, in 1970, of children younger than five, the most vulnerable children. Uh, to me, one of the, one of the issues of, of why there is, a, there is an international role in education and it's in, in developing goals such as this is because we have access to this information. Uh, this, is, this is something that, the, that the, uh, the parent in a little rural school in Chad uh, is, not going to, is not going to know or to understand. Uh, those who have access to that information do have some, uh, some obligation around that. Uh, that's something we can discuss further, and exactly how you play out that obligation is, is an important discussion. Uh, let me talk very quickly about the, the uh, Fast Track Initiative now. Uh, the Fast Track Initiative essentially was developed on, on the basis that uh, there is a, a human right to education, and that if we are to enforce this human right to education, that we, we better do it in a way that we're all talking to one another. So the Fast Track Initiative is a partnership. Essentially, all of the uh, major partners working on education, all of the bilaterals, uh, all of the multilaterals, uh, many foundations, uh, and many NGOs, not to mention private sector actors as well. Um, so it's a global partnership, essentially between the donors and uh, the low-income uh, countries that are working with us. Uh, just if you're interested, I put a bunch of folders over there. You're welcome to help yourself and, and take uh, some. They give you more background on the Fast Track Initiative. But the idea of the Fast Track Initiative, in many ways, it, it has to do with wrestling with this question. What is the legitimate role of external support? What are the obligations? Uh, we have worked just this past uh, year to develop something we're calling the Mutual Accountability Framework, in a usual um, technocratic jargon. Uh, but all that means is we're trying to figure out what it means to be a partner. What are your obligations if you're going to be a partner working with a, a developing country? Uh, there are many power imbalances in working uh, in such a relationship. One of the first things I, I learned uh, when I uh, began working at the World Bank uh, was that the conversations that you're having, and this is important for you to understand because some of you will have these conversations, the conversations that you have in, uh, in, in, in a low-income country uh, is, is not, is not uh, an honest conversation. It's not, it's not an unbiased conversation. There, there are biases that you have to be aware of. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can't, I think, legitimately uh, provide the sort of uh, support that you need to be providing. You have to recognize that uh, certainly working as a representative of the World Bank, uh, for me, I had to recognize that I wasn't having this conversation because uh, the, the, the Prime Minister or the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Education was necessarily enthralled with, with, with my intellect uh, and, and my understanding of the issues he was grappling with. You know, we were having the conversation because I potentially had money. Uh, there was money somewhere in the background, and he had to accommodate me in some way uh, if they were going to get access to the money, and they needed the money. They had kids uh, 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 in conditions in schools that, that, that could be improved, and, and those people legitimately cared about that, and in some ways, I was a hurdle that they had to get through or get around if they were going to get access to that. And you have to be humble about this process. When you're having these conversations, you have to recognize that that's there and that's a part of the conversation. And if you can't understand that, you probably shouldn't have the conversation um, because it means that you're going to get, you're, you're going to get too, um, uh, too intent on selling your own ideas and you're not going to be ready to listen to the ideas that people are bringing. The Fast Track Initiative tries to do that. We're try we, we are deliberately set up to say uh, countries are in the best position to solve their problems. Uh, we do recognize that in, in many countries, uh, for a range of reasons, uh, those who are best positioned uh, to, to bring answers to those problems may not have a voice in the discussion. So one of the things that we try to do is to make sure that uh, those who are most concerned actually have a voice uh, in the discussion, whether that means uh, marginalized uh, ethnic groups or, 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 or uh, women's groups, uh, groups representing children with disability, uh, those in isolated rural areas, uh, families living in extreme poverty, and so on. So to me, one of the legitimate roles uh, of an external agency is to facilitate uh, a dialogue among those who are best positioned uh, to resolve the issues. Uh, I want to say a little bit here about, about how the process works, and then I also want to talk a little bit about the moral, some of the moral hazards that are related to this. Fast Track Initiative works on a compact, again, I've used the term mutual accountability. Essentially, the low-income countries uh, promise to put together sound programs, to implement sound policies. And the donor community and those who are working with them, the, the, oftentimes the NGOs and others who may not like to be lumped together with the donors and may see themselves as a different group again, 
But essentially, you have on the one hand the, the, the country representatives, and the other hand, you have the external voices. And both of them are promising uh, to behave in certain ways that have the child's best interest at heart. Country promises to pull together good education sector plans. That's been the heart of the Fast Track Initiative. Uh, so far, we have uh, 45, 43, uh, you'll see in slides, but we have two just finishing now. Uh, 45 countries that have pulled together what we consider to be solid education sector plans that we don't ourselves evaluate, that are evaluated at the local level. Um, that's the commitment. The country also commits to put its resources into the program. Uh, one of the things that we don't want to be doing is putting uh, our financing in only for the government to take their financing out of education and put it into, you know, into arms or something else. Uh, the donors on their side agree to mobilize additional resources. And they agree to make it predictable, to make it harmonized so that governments are kind of getting the same uh, dialogue regardless of where the funding is coming from, and to align uh, the things that they're supporting with the national priorities. Uh, we say a little bit here about, about that, how that's working. Uh, but I, just, just before going on to the next slide, I do want to say a word about this. There are a number of moral hazards uh, involved in this. Uh, you are, at some point, you are setting up a system to define you know, what is a good policy. Who, who decides what a good policy is and what a good policy isn't? There is a lot of debate about this in the international community. There's a, there's a, a term that you undoubtedly have heard, uh, hands-off development. Uh, uh, Nancy Birdsell, Center for Global Development, uh, have, have pushed very hard the idea of hands-off development. Uh, hands-off development means that the government is in the best position to know what it needs. Donors just need to say, when you provide the results, we'll give you the money. So you get your kids in school. We're not going to ask you how it happens. We're just going to give you the money. So you solve it, and we'll stop giving you our solutions. Um, uh, at, at one level, there's a certain appeal to that. Uh, I think there are a lot of flaws in the argument as well, uh, because I don't think governments typically work in that kind of benevolent fashion. Uh, our experience is that you actually have to bargain pretty hard, uh, uh, both at the national level and the international level, to keep a focus on children's best interests. Uh, I don't think it just happens. But nevertheless, that's an argument that's out there, and it's one that you have to be prepared to respond to. I, I would say that this is probably uh, the key moral issue that you're going to be facing working in the field of development is, is, is where, is your, where does your legitimacy derive from and how do you answer the question, uh, why are you making decisions for me? Why are you deciding what is right for me? The, uh, the Fast Track Initiative has, has uh, taken, a, I, I think, a fairly bold position and it's one that sometimes uh, leads to some controversy in all of this. We have said on the one hand that countries develop their own education sector programs and will support the process. All of the countries we work in, all of the education sector plans that are, are, developed, are developed nationally, they're approved nationally. Sometimes the donors internationally say, no, we should be telling them if it's good enough or not good enough, but we, we allow that to be a, a, a decision of the local education community, including government, NGOs, uh, donors, uh, uh, civil society representatives working within the government. They form their own education group, they decide. Uh, but there are some things that we, we also uh, have, have brought in from the outside. Uh, for instance, uh, just to give you two or three examples, uh, we, have, we have insisted on a, on a focus on, uh, or on including um, uh, the most marginalized children. We developed a, 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 a tool, an analytic tool for this purpose called the Equity and Inclusion Tool. Uh, by which governments have to demonstrate that they have given uh, real thought to how to ensure that uh, girls have an equal chance within the system, uh, that the most marginalized uh, rural children, those living in extreme isolation or extreme poverty, children with disabilities, uh, uh, children who are working uh, in a child labor, um, a, a range of children who are somehow on the margins, ethnic uh, minorities, uh, linguistic minorities, that these issues are being taken into consideration. So that's one area that we, we insist on. Another area is fairly simple, one time on task. When we started the Fast Track Initiative in 2002, uh, a number of countries were interested in joining. One thing we quickly came to discover was that the, the length of the school year varied dramatically across countries. Uh, from two, 280 hours uh, a year was the lowest that we had for many of the countries coming in. And they were maxing out around 860 or so. So that was the general range. In developed countries, the length of the school year at the primary school uh, is typically around 1,000 hours. There's a little variation, but typically anywhere from 960 to a little over 1,000 hours a year of student-teacher contact. 
none of, not a single one of the FTI countries were, were reaching that norm uh, when they first joined the compact. And as I say, many of them were at perhaps one third or just barely over one fourth of those levels. So one thing we quickly established was that we, we were going to support countries, but we were expecting that they would pull together national plans that reached the international norms. Uh, clearly, they, they, they could, they could uh, have some flexibility in that, but we expected to see them somewhere around 1,000 hours uh, per year. We also had the issue, particularly in West Africa, that some of the countries we were, we were uh, being asked to support had extremely high repetition rates. Uh, repetition rates, uh, meaning the, 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 the percentage of children who failed any given year at primary school, uh, that were frequently higher than 20%. I think we had seven countries higher than 20%. Uh, we had one higher than 30%. Uh, Togo, I think, was our record at 35% of children in primary school failing each year. Well, the simple fact is you can't get to universal primary education if 35% if, if of your children are failing each year. It's just not possible. You're going to have 10 or 15% uh, coming out at the far end. And we quickly changed the goalpost to say we weren't interested in just getting all the kids into school. We wanted all children out of school. So we changed the goal to having all children graduating from primary school. Uh, we actually had to develop an indicator that wasn't being collected by anybody, the, the primary completion rate. And we had a young guy named Andrew Clark sitting in an office day in and day out trying to figure out what the primary completion rate until two years later we were able to pass that job off to, to UNESCO. Uh, but the goal was to figure out uh, what were the kind of the, the, the big questions without which uh, success was unlikely? And we, uh, we set that as a condition of, of, of joining the partnership, and, and countries signed on for that. But again, I, I'm saying that this is the kind of a moral challenge you have. Uh, how, much, uh, how much you come in imposing certain, uh, a certain vision of the way the world ought to be, and how much do you come in listening? Uh, I'm not suggesting we got the balance right, but. Those are the things we grappled with. One of the other challenges was, was on getting uh, teachers, uh, uh, teachers paid. 80 to 90 percent, in some cases 95 percent, of the, of the uh, Ministry of Education budgets for primary schooling is teacher salaries. Uh, the donors were typically investing uh, mostly in investments, uh, in, in uh, construction or in textbooks. Almost no investment was happening on the recurrent side. We estimated early that between 60 and 70 percent of the needs were recurrent budget support. We also took a decision early to provide support for teacher salaries. When you provide support for teacher salaries, there's a whole range of moral hazards that come with that. What if you're providing support and a year later you withdraw the support? What happens with the teachers? I'm not going to try to answer that, but those are the kinds of issues that we have, we've grappled with. We, we decided to go forward uh, with that at any rate. How do you decide how much to pay teachers? Who decides? Um, again, issues that are out there. Just some of the results. Uh, the one thing I will say, uh, a lot of issues were out there, but in terms of results, the, the, the Fast Track Initiative Partnership has, has produced, some, I think, some fairly impressive results over uh, you know, the, eight years of its the eight years of its existence for which we have, which we have uh, data. Uh, the number of children enrolled in the countries in Africa uh, went up by just over 50%. I think it's 52%. Um, the, uh, the, the, the comparator, and it's hard to get exact comparators, but the countries in Africa that weren't in the initiative also saw enrollment increases, but about half of that, uh, about half of that level. Uh, similar story on uh, primary completion. PCR there is primary completion rate. Uh, the numbers are a little less impressive, from 61% to 72%, but that's partially because primary completion, which is the indicator that we decided we would be measured by, is actually a lagged indicator. Uh, it, it, it takes six years for a child to enter the first year to actually show results. So the results that we're showing, for the most part, uh, are reflecting just the first few years of surges uh, of children coming into school. Uh, we've worked with, uh, we have 43 countries that have completed the process of developing education plans. This is a relatively complex process for which we're also criticized. It can take anywhere from uh, six months to 18 months. Before you get, we insist on getting everybody in the country around the table, everybody into a dialogue, uh, and then uh, we have a lot of tough choices to make about how funds are going to be spent over the next, typically five years. Uh, so far, we have uh, we have dispersed about uh, 2.2. Uh, we have allocated about 2.2 billion dollars. About most of that started in 95, 96. Um, we're currently uh, allocating somewhere in the range of 400 to 500 million dollars uh, annually. The funding has never been the key part of it. There's more money going out through the through the partners uh, than through our, our own resources. The basic idea of the Fast Track Initiative has been to get people around the, the table agreeing on policy. Um, 
Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but one thing that we're, we're quite proud of is the fact that domestic financing, the financing that the countries themselves put in, has actually gone up. That's, that's been a challenge, uh, for instance, for the health fund people. They've, they've struggled against the fact that when they bring in health funds, the governments then often divert the funds. And that's one thing that we think has been a strength of this, uh, of this model. Um, but financing is an issue. Uh, we are still uh, well below the levels uh, uh, that we want. Uh, you see, if you look at this, uh, this chart, you'll see an encouraging sign. Every time I've shown these charts in the past until actually this presentation, I just got these data in, in, the, last, uh, in the last two weeks, uh, it's been a pretty negative story. The, the financing has stagnated. We, we doubled uh, uh, financing, uh, actually almost tripled financing for, for basic education in low-income countries in the first four or five years after, uh, after this initiative began. Uh, by about, uh, actually by 04, and then uh, the, uh, the numbers have stagnated and actually dropped a little bit until just this year. Uh, just last year, uh, the numbers shot, uh, actually shot sky high. We're, we're now uh, well over triple where we were at the start of the decade, which is good news. The, the bad news is that we have to triple again if we're going to get anywhere close to where uh, we ought to be. We ought to be at around somewhere between 10, 11, 12 billion dollars a year in external aid if we really want to reach these goals. Um, and, and we're simply not there yet. Uh, you may also say that it's quite counterintuitive that, that there's been such a, uh, uh, an increase in financing over the past year, given the global education crisis, or econ economic crisis. And I would agree with that. That's largely true. And this is somewhat of an artifact. We're nervous about next year. This is somewhat of an artifact of the, uh, of the planning cycles. Uh, donors typically lock in their, their, their funding amounts pretty much two years in advance. So the, the process uh, the, for the uh, 2009 allocations typically would have been uh, set in place in 2007, just before the crisis began. So we, we certainly are nervous as to what's, uh, what's happening going forward. Uh, at any rate, I, I want to talk a little bit just uh, at this point, I need to get to the theme of this discussion, uh, which, which was talking about uh, uh, learning outcomes. Uh, within the, the Fast Track Initiative, we'll be having major announcements over the next two months in four areas. One has to do with financing. We'll be announcing a big uh, replenishment exercise, not just replenishment of the funds that we directly manage, you know, that, that, that amount that's been a couple of billion dollars so over the last few years. Uh, but we're also uh, pushing for more financing for the sector as a whole. And we'll announce that uh, within about two weeks. Uh, we will also be uh, developing a program. I'm going up to UNICEF tomorrow in New York uh, to discuss a program uh, for working more closely with UNICEF for a specific set of conflict-affected countries. Uh, these are the countries that have uh, six of them put together that have half of the world's out-of-school children. So we'll be putting together a program uh, for them. Uh, strategies to improve learning, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. And also the question of greater attention to, to, uh, to gender issues and uh, to inclusion as a whole. Now, I, I want to just talk a little bit now for the rest of this uh, uh, presentation about learning. And I want to start off by dispelling a myth there is a myth out there that if you're going to invest uh, in improving the quality of education, then uh, you're, you're condemning some children to be out of school, that you can't have it both ways, kids in school and uh, real learning going on. I don't know how well you can see this or not, but basically uh, this is a chart that, that, that challenges that. Uh, if you actually look at it, the, the chart tells you that the two go in, in tandem in most cases. There are only a few exceptions. Uh, generally speaking, if you're, you don't increase access until you've increased quality for all sorts of reasons, including the fact that the high repetition rates, the parents getting discouraged that the kids aren't learning and so on, these children just don't persist in schooling. Uh, when girls aren't given equal opportunities in the classroom, they drop out at much higher rates. Uh, so this, this is actually taken at, uh, at the secondary school level, but a, a cluster of countries, uh, this is a comparison on uh, taking uh, TIMS, the, uh, the third international mathematics and science uh, uh, studies. Uh, and looking at the countries that, that had large numbers of kids in school also tended to do better on, on the results. And countries that had fewer children in school tended to, to do worse. Uh, there's one outlier down there, which is South Africa, which has uh, kind of a separate history for sure. Uh, but in South Africa, you had, uh, uh, you had uh, relatively high access. And this is to secondary in this case. Relatively high access, but very low levels of learning overall. But that, in general, seems not to be the case. Uh, you don't have to uh, say, we'll do access first, and then we'll work on learning later. 
Uh, just let me give you a quick uh, a quote here from uh, Hanushek and Wussman. Uh, schooling that does not improve cognitive skills has limited impact on aggregate economic outcomes and on economic development. So learning really does matter. Uh, it's not just that we think we can do it, we think that we have to do it if we're going to make progress. Uh, Beth King, who is uh, the, uh, uh, the head of the uh, education network at the World Bank, uh, recently said that it's workers' skills uh, that determine uh, his or her productivity and ability to adapt. Uh, knowledge and skills also contribute to an individual's ability to have a healthy and educated family. It's not just the, 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 the diploma, the, the parking ticket. Individuals may get some impact in terms of their own uh, economic well-being from the certification uh, impact of, of uh, having a certain diploma, whether or not they have the skills. But that's a very limited impact, and certainly at the, at the societal level, uh, that doesn't matter. So without going much more into those arguments, at the Fast Track Initiative, we have adopted two uh, indicators that we're now collecting for all of our countries, uh, one at the uh, early part of the primary cycle and one at the end of the cycle. Essentially, in both cases, um, uh, looking at reading, uh, uh, reading skills or reading fluency. Uh, we, have supported, uh, we have supported tests. Uh, uh, I think it's now um, 27, 28 countries. Uh, trying to find out just what the levels of learning are. Uh, Professor Wagner has, has uh, talked about uh, uh, SQC approaches, which are smarter, quicker, cheaper approaches. And this is essentially what we've tried to do. In fact, we worked with them closely in, in, in developing uh, this approach. Um, essentially trying to say that uh, we can, we can uh, help countries get a better sense of, of whether children are progressing uh, by looking at uh, looking at fairly simple measures uh, of reading outcomes. We're focusing on reading initially. We're, we're going to certainly encourage countries to work on mathematics and science and other areas that are important. But we're taking reading as a, as a starting point because it's foundational to so many other things. And we're developing a fairly straightforward, reasonably simple approach. Uh, it's not without controversy. And if, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to, to raise those questions as well. But we're, we're trying to say not just more funding, but smarter funding. Uh, there is a, an NGO that some of you know, and I know that the university and, and, uh, and the department uh, has, a, has a relationship uh, with this group, uh, Pratham, in, uh, in, uh, in India. Uh, Rukmini, this, this uh, phrase comes from Rukmini Banerjee, who, who is the chief education advisor for that program. Uh, in India, uh, Pratham is this huge NGO working with millions of children. And they're promoting the idea of a surge in learning. Just as there's been a surge in access since 2000, uh, they believe a surge in learning is possible. And we're working on that basis, uh, not just putting in more funding, but smarter funding that targets kids actually learning initially how to read, but then to do the other things that come with that. Uh, some of the areas that we're looking at from uh, what we believe is the evidence out there, uh, we've identified so far five principles that we're uh, now intending to apply uh, in dialogue with all of the countries we're working with. Uh, one is uh, probably the most controversial of these, and this again gets to the question of who decides what. Uh, language of instruction. You know, this, is, this is about as, uh, as controversial as you can get. Language is so closely tied up with sense of identity uh, the, and, and sense of nationhood and everything else that it's, it's hard to imagine anything uh, more difficult uh, to, uh, to hold a dialogue around. But the simple uh, facts are from a pedagogical perspective. We think the evidence is incontrovertible that children learn to read at a much better pace when they learn their own language. We, we support uh, processes of transition and moving over to the international language. In most countries, children will need a, a, a language like English or French or Portuguese, but a language which provides Spanish, a language which provides uh, uh, better access to the world. Uh, but in terms of the initial reading experiences, we also think that there's all sorts of evidence to suggest that when reading happens in a language that children don't understand, uh, they will spend three or four years uh, minimum uh, before learning basic decoding skills. And the, the results from our, our uh, analysis show that. Uh, we have uh, found more than 50% of the children after four years of primary schooling across uh, 27 countries, uh, with the exception of, I think, two of those countries, more than 50% of children unable to read uh, at all, simply unable to decode, uh, in most cases, uh, unable to decode a single word words chosen at random. It doesn't mean they don't know some words, but given the test, uh, scoring at the zero level on the test. Uh, 
language of instruction is hugely important. Increased academic learning time. We also did a study and found that in at least one country, a children, the individual child was getting six minutes per day of reading, uh, of reading um, uh, practice. Uh, that's not going to be enough to learn how to read. Uh, a study done of the, uh, that we also uh, financed in, in Cameroon of the Com ethnic group in Cameroon found that the average child after three years of schooling uh, had, had read or had read to them uh, between 1,000 and 3,000 words. Uh, the average child in the U.S. Uh, by the same age uh, will have read between 1 million and 3 million words. That's a difference of 1,000 to 1. Uh, and children just not getting a chance uh, to read, they're not getting the time, and they're not getting access to, to materials. So materials is also on our list. Uh, and uh, attention to phonemic awareness. Most of the uh, languages in developing countries have one huge advantage in that they have shallow orthographies. They're, 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 they're very phonetic. It, 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 decoding is relatively straightforward as compared, say, to English, uh, which has a much more complex, uh, and it's had many more debates around how you approach reading. Uh, most uh, uh, shallow orthographies, uh, introduction to phonemic awareness in our experience uh, in a scripted fashion, given some support to teachers, uh, results in, uh, uh, in quite rapid uh, learning. We have some very promising uh, efforts underway right now at a small scale in, in uh, 400 schools in Mali and in, in, in 30 or 40 schools in, in Niger and in several other places in Kenya. Um, and we are seeing at that modest level, a surge in learning. So we'll be putting our investments heavily into this over the next couple of years. Uh, getting back to this question uh, of evaluation, uh, we believe that the, the main purpose of evaluation is not to do cross-country or cross-national comparisons. Uh, and I, we were saying over lunch, and this is a point of, of some contention uh, between the World Bank and ourselves. I, I, I'm actually not in the World Bank right now. I've, I've been on, outside the World Bank. I've loaned to this program, the Fast Track Initiative, for the last four years. Um, and we're we're finding this somewhat controversial. The, the, within the World Bank, in particular, the economists' uh, uh, le legitimate concern, but nevertheless, we end up in very different places on this, is where do you, where do you invest? Where do you place your investments? And how do you make the case uh, for the best use of investments? And being able to do cross-country comparisons, which country is using its funding the most, uh, the most effectively, uh, that's an interest of considerable concern. Uh, from our perspective as educators, uh, we have some economists in our group, but from the education side of things, our concern is the use of evaluations to inform uh, instructional decisions and financing around that. Uh, let, me, let me wrap up here so we can, uh, we can ask a few questions. Uh, at, at the country level, uh, uh, some of the, the implications of all of this, uh, maybe I'll, I'll go over quickly this, but it, it's the idea of getting these ideas into a national level uh, policy dialogue. Um, again, the question of moral hazard. Uh, if we just come in with ideas from outside, uh, you know, that, that, that has a lot of uh, uh, likelihood that it won't be sustainable and won't be well received. How do you get these sorts of ideas into a national dialogue? And part of that is feeding evidence into the dialogue. So a big goal uh, that we have within the partnership, we, we organize annual reviews of education sector plans by all of the partners in each of the countries. So we, we organize at least 43 uh, of those uh, each year and trying to make sure that there's an evidence basis for those. Uh, for those discussions uh, is a big goal of ours. Uh, I'm going to close with just saying something on, on gender and learning. Uh, for many years, we have pushed hard. And, and to me, this is kind of the, the, the positive side uh, and the negative side of external uh, uh, interventions. A, a positive contribution that has come from outside many of the developing countries has been the, F, the, the focus on, on giving girls a voice in the country. The, the ratio of, of, of girls to boys was astonishingly low. Uh, in many countries. When I started working on Guinea in, in West Africa, there were two boys for every girl in school. It was, one of the, it was actually 32% to 68%, so slightly more than two boys for every girl in school. Uh, we pushed hard on this question uh, uh, with most countries saying that unless you had girls in school, uh, the country wasn't going to progress. And we had a lot of success. Now that's accepted almost universally. But perhaps the negative side of that was we, we came at that very much from an access, uh, sorry, from an advocacy perspective. Uh, thinking that people, uh, you know, parents weren't sending their kids to school just because they didn't know, it, well, their girls in particular, they didn't know it was a good thing to send their girls to school. So we just tried to make sure that they knew this was a good thing. So we, we pushed hard on, on the, 
the information and advocacy side of things. But it turned out that parents actually were making pretty rational decisions all along. They weren't sending their girls to school because it was, in their particular set of circumstances, a rational thing not to send your girls to school. Maybe the school wasn't a safe place to be. Maybe the girl didn't have any opportunities if she went to school. Uh, so the, the, the effort now has been to look much more at saying, OK, not just convincing parents that they should send their girls, but asking why is it a rational decision that parents are making not to send the girls to school? And how can one revisit that so it's a rational decision to send your, your, your girl to school? Another area that we missed out, I would say almost completely for almost a decade, was the importance of looking at differential learning patterns within the classroom once the girls got to school. Uh, this is something we're looking at very closely now. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over some of these. This is just showing that we've actually made some successes in getting more girls into school in, in, in the countries. But I want to look at this particular chart. This is a chart taken from the PISA test from 2009. There were 65 countries that took part in, t in PISA. Uh, this is the, the um, uh, progress in student achievement, is that the? No, that's not. Pro uh, student assessment, that's it, yeah, thank you. Um, the, the, um, uh, the PISA test is essentially measuring uh, uh, outcomes at the, at the age of, of uh, 15. And in, in this case, uh, these are, uh, this is a reading test done at the age of 15 across 65 countries, all of which are either uh, high income or middle income countries. And the one striking thing, the, this, this uh, chart is showing the, the, the girls' advantage in reading. Um, in all of these countries, without any exception, girls have a huge advantage in reading. From bottom to top, they have a greater advantage. They average in this, uh, the, across the OECD countries, they averaged uh, 39 score points ahead of boys. I'm not going to go into the whole area of why that's happening, uh, but girls in developed countries start off reading at a much higher level than boys. Uh, I just want to show you what's happening in the low-income countries. So I haven't got, I'll have to work on these charts to make them look a little more comparable. But uh, you, this is taken from SACMEC, which are tests done in, uh, on educational quality in southern and central Africa. And you'll see here that in the few countries to the left, girls are achieving better than boys. If you actually look at the names of those countries, uh, those are all uh, either high-income or middle-income countries. Then if you look to the right, all of the low-income countries, without any exception, uh, you see the opposite. There's no, either there's no significant difference between boys and, uh, and girls, or girls are doing worse. Uh, the simple fact is that we're seeing a very different pattern in developing countries, and it's something we haven't focused on. There's a gender element to learning. Whatever is going on in developed countries that's leading girls to, to, to be ahead without any exception, also is not happening in any developing country without any exception. Um, all of which, again, raises the question, so what do you do about that coming in from the outside? Uh, is, is this a question you can legitimately raise? If so, uh, in what way uh, uh, and, and how do you encourage a dialogue around this? How do you get uh, girls themselves or, or, or women uh, uh, involved in that, in that dialogue? I just want, I'm just going to finish up with that, uh, and if there are, if there are questions, uh, I'd be happy to respond to them. I just again want to emphasize that within the Fast Track Initiative, we've taken a policy decision, uh, again, an external decision. Luckily, we do have many developing uh, countries represented on our board now, so we have an inclusive process for making these decisions. Uh, but we have taken the decision that we will focus heavily on, uh, on learning outcomes over the next uh, three or four years, so that all of the, all of the programs that we're supporting will include uh, specific attention uh, to results, and we have we have given ourselves uh, the target of ensuring that children achieve at least basic literacy uh, within two years in all of the schools that we're supporting. We have adopted a results framework. Our replenishment exercise, where we're asking donors for funding this year, is premised on a results approach. So we're saying these are the results we're going to produce, um, and and you can put your money kind of into this program contingent upon us achieving those results. Okay, so let me, let me stop there. There's various Twitter addresses and Facebook addresses and different things if you want to follow up.